Well, hello and welcome back to the Andrew Eborn Show with me, Andrew Eborn, and I'm delighted to be joined again by Steve Welchman. How are we doing, Steve? Hmm. Still good. Still good. Still good. It's always good. <laughs> I'll tell you what, we had such a good time last time talking about your career and how our paths crossed a few times and lots of the Indeed. wonderful characters uh, that mm -hmm. we know in this. And it's all about characters, isn't it? Because that's one of the things you say, one of the patterns, if you like, is that it's become very corporate. You're very, say, look, you lose the soul, the heart and soul, mm -hmm. don't just chase the money, look for the characters, look for the talent in there because the money will follow. Maybe you should write my book because just talk to me, I keep, these stories keep coming up. I've just thought of another one. Oh, absolutely. Well, <laughs> well, this is what happens, Steve. Is I, I, I approach all of the interviews that I do rather like uh, my, my job as a barrister. You do all the research mm -hmm. so that I know more about the person I'm interviewing than they do about themselves. Yes. So I remind yes. you, it's good, isn't it? It's, yes. <laughs> one, one of the glorious things that we touched on last time were uh, three of your wonderful times on airplanes. Just remind us very quickly about those three occasions, because I believe you've got your passports with you now. Okay, so, well, the, I, I can't remember the chronology was probably 74 flying first class to Pan Am sitting next to Bette Davis. There you go. Let's get a close up of it. I don't, I don't know how you can see that. Can you see it? Yeah, that looks amazing. Hello to Steve. Yep. Brilliant. And, um, Think the chronology. Um, so that would have been 70. Yeah. So then uh, Tokyo to London, sitting next to the maestro Herbert von Karajan. And actually, I should have said, and he got out a, a little chess board, an electronic chess game with pieces, which we decided to start playing just after takeoff. And by the time we arrived in London, 18 hours later, plus an hour in Anchorage, Alaska, we'd only made about three moves because we talked the whole time. And that's the maestro. Let's have a look. Uh, move, move, it, move it over to your left. To the left, to the left, to the left. There you go. That's the maestro. You can't read it, but that's his autograph. Yeah, excellent. And move over to the Bet Davis one again because it's on the same same page, isn't it? Hold hold the other one up again. Hold the passport up again. Well, Bet Davis. Yeah, yeah. Move over to the left again. To the left. I sound like the golden shot. There you go. Hello to Steve uh, Bet Davis. Fantastic. I love it. Yeah. Fantastic. This is a great passport. I'll give you a fiver for your passport. Yeah. <laughs> and then. Yeah. Hi, Steve. And that looks like Frank Sinatra. Yes, sir. Absolutely brilliant. No, we love it. We love it. That's That's got to be good, hasn't it? So you, you you take the fiver then. If I send you the fiver today, you'll put, post the passport over to me. If you put a few zeros by it, I'll consider it. <laughs> I mean, I'll tell you what's extraordinary, because your career is peppered with opportunities together with you being yourself as opposed to some corporate uh blamange if you like putting it that mm -hmm. way um mm -hmm. and that's the really interesting thing when we start to talk about ken hensley and mm -hmm. how did you meet ken okay um we didn't cover earlier but um my original time at charisma but in 1970 we'd sign a well we we're going to sign a band called nazareth but strat wasn't comfortable about having a rock and roll band on Charisma because he wanted it to be more eclectic. So the BNC record side had a label, started a label called Mooncrest. Nazareth went on to Mooncrest and I was working both sides, BNC acts and, and Charisma acts. So I worked a little on their first album and then started working more and more with them. And they were managed by an extraordinary individual called Bill Fahilly, oh, a yes. Scotsman, unbelievably wealthy, but not for music, who liked the band and liked the idea of 
being successful in entertainment, but didn't have a clue about the industry. And, and he looked like a Viking warlord. He did, didn't you he? Know, <laughs> growing silver gray hair and weighed hundreds of pounds, a full beard, um, and loved me. Um, Just as well, as scary and, otherwise. And, and he, he kept saying, what are they paying you? I'll double it. And then after about four years, and there were some things going on at Charisma, which I think will be in the book, um, that I didn't like. That were, sorry. So it, it was going to become, the horses are going to bolt before the barn doors are closed kind of thing. And um, so I, I was thinking about leaving. And then at that weak moment in my emotions, Bill called me and offered me like four times what I was earning. And I said, right, I'm coming. So I worked with Nazareth, um, luckily right in a great period because we then made a uh, loud and proud album. Yeah. And then the hair of the dog album, we had number ones in America and I'm on the road and it's just fantastic. And, and um, mountain management, wasn't it? Mountain management, yeah. And then Bill, sadly, it, uh, died with his 10-year-old son and his CFO of his main business in a private plane crash. He was only 42. And, and I left. Um, I just, no, you know, without Bill even being there as a figurehead, it just wasn't right. Plus, I'd also been asked to go work with Bowie. So, But I stayed in touch with Naz, like my mates. And I'm still in touch with them to this day. And at the end of the 90s, um, Daryl, the original drummer, had died. And he'd been managing them for like 15 years. And the two surviving members, the singer Dan and Pete, the bass player, basically called me and said, Stevie, help. <laughs> and I spent some years from 99, sorting out all their publishing and recording agreements around the world. And actually did a catalog deal for them. Um, and, um, and in 2009, um, and I only finished that and got that catalog sorted in 2007. That's how long it took. And then I got them to a, a made of I got them a song in a movie or something. Um, and, um, um, and they called me up and said, look, we're on tour in Europe. Um, as a thank you for, do you fancy spend a weekend with us? Right. You know, we're doing this outdoor amphitheater show in the Czech Republic. You know, we fly out on a Friday, you know, go home on a Sunday, whatever. I said, yeah, it'd be great. I'm not doing anything that weekend. So fly out on a Friday a nice dinner with them Saturday, just hang out, hang out. Then we went down to the sound check. And when we went down to the sound check, I finally saw posters for this show and it had, you know, Nazareth headline and it got special guest, Ken Hensley and live fire. And I turned around to Pete and I went, Ken Hensley. I said, I haven't seen him since he in the seventies in London. And I made my mind up that I was going to go out front to the sound desk, now it's desk, and watched Ken's show, which I did. And one, I couldn't believe his energy. Yeah. I mean, it's fantastic. His band were really good. And he announced his last song. The place was going ballistic. It wasn't huge. It was, I think it was limited, like five and a half thousand or something. Yeah. And, but I knew there was a curfew. So I went backstage and I said to Tam, the Naz's production manager, I said, look, I said, there's a curfew, right? He said, yeah. I said, well, you can't let Hensley do an encore because Naz will run out of time. He went, yeah, you're right. I said, well, as soon as he comes off, go and tell him. He said, well, I can't do it, Steve, will you? And I went, sure. So Ken comes off with his band, place going crazy. I said, hi, Ken, sorry to say this, mate, but you can't do it. There's a curfew. You can't do an encore. Got to get Nazareth on. 
He was like, looked at me like, all right. That was that. Then obviously at some stage when Nazareth were playing, he left. Following morning at the hotel, I'm always up early. I wake up, I'm sitting down. It's a buffet breakfast. And uh, five minutes, Ken walks over with a plate of food. He says, do you mind if I sit here? And I, sure. So we just started talking. We were talking for a while. Um, and then he was telling me he lived in Spain. Yeah. He'd lived in Spain since 2000. Alicante. And, right. Yep, or near, near, about 40 minutes from there, in the middle of nowhere. And um, about a week later, 10 days, phone call. Hi, Steve, it's Ken Hensley. I said, hello, Ken. He said, listen, he said, um, if I sent you an air ticket, he said, will you come down for a weekend? And I said, well, you know, it's always great to be in the south of Spain in the summer. And I love the sun. I said, but in what regard? Just for a chat or? And he said, whether you might consider representing me. So I said, OK, yeah, you send me the ticket, I'll come. Next weekend is fine. Within an hour, he'd emailed me a ticket. I spent three days on and off looking at the internet and for Ken Hensley and Live Fire, couldn't find any records, couldn't find a record that Ken had made for uh, about three years. And I knew at a distance the heap history. And um, anyway, so I went down and, you know, if you like, the first half day was just pleasantries and then let's sit down and talk, talk. And um, and I said, why do you want me to represent you? I said, what, what do you, you know, I said, I can't find any records with you in your band. Why not? And he said, Steve, he said, my next birthday, I'm 65. He said, it's different days now. I said, at my age, nobody's going to sign me to make records. And I said, well, if I get involved, that's our first target. That's first part of our plan. And then we'll take it from there. I said, what have you been doing live-wise? Because there's not a lot out there. And he didn't have an agent. He obviously hadn't had a manager for about nine years. Um, he'd done a few shows with his band um, 2007, a few in 2008, some solo shows in Russia where he were very popular. Um, so I kind of started from that point and said, you know, I'll get involved, but I'll, I will, I will want you to make records. It's all up. That's all he wanted to do was write songs and make records. You, you know, if Ken was here now, the first thing he'd tell you that he did professionally is a songwriter. Yeah. Well, and, and what a great songwriter for, for those who, I mean, as you said, and, your research yeah. on, on, on Uriah Heave. I mean, he was uh, the principal writer, great. Well, he writer, was, writer, yes. Easy living, look at yourself. Fantastic yeah. writer. Yeah. From Uriah Heep, which is probably one of a uh, huge talk about underestimated bands for whatever reason, the fans yeah. love them. But the well, the the record them. company um, forget all the ones that used to have it, but BMG Sanctuary have had it, and we uh, we, we launched uh, re released a uh, entire box set of all their recordings in October, and and they've sent awards out for. The sales of over 40 million records. Huge, huge. And, and so, yeah, so it was a songwriter. So I got involved with Ken, uh, got him to start writing. Within a year, he was making his first record with a band. And my book of answers is the ninth record we've made in 11 years. I love it. I love it. And it's out today. This is what I love. It the is. Book. The fifth it is the only copy in the world. <laughs> I love it, but I love it. But it's like a real thing because all of them, all of them have got a story behind all of the tracks. Mm -hmm. What he's done, and it's also a fantastic story about yeah. how he met. Yeah. We talk about yeah. airplanes, and you've met Sinatra, yeah. and you've met Venus, yeah. and all this sort of yeah. coincidence in this mm -hmm. business. Are yeah, so it's it. And and it's and on on a few levels and 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 it, shall I tell you about yeah, it? Go for it. Yeah. Um, so as I mentioned uh, just a minute ago about Russia. Okay. Yeah. So um, I I also acted as Ken's agent as well as manager, 
So it was very apparent early on, I was getting inquiries from Russia and inquiries to some great connections. And so we built the live side up in Russia where if Ken was still with us, it's his biggest live market in the world. It's incredible. Um, and, you know, I've done, we've done what, two shows in the Kremlin Palace with his band and a 44 piece symphony orchestra in the v BKZ venue in St. Petersburg. We've done two shows with a band, his band, 44 piece symphony orchestra and a 50 piece children's choir. Right. Um, you know, we did a, a show in 2018 World Cup year, quarterfinals, England were playing in Novokuznetsk, Southwest Siberia to 45,000 people. In 2016, we did 45,000 plus in Vladivostok. You can't get any further east than Vladivostok. It sits on the Sea of Japan. And so in 2018 and 2019, we were unbelievably busy. Yeah. 18 was shows all over the planet and 19 was shows and we recorded another album which we never wanted to come out until the end of this year right. and we didn't know about my book of answers okay and the one that if you like i'm sitting on which i will not discuss with anybody before you discussed it with Andrew Eborn on the Andrew Eborn show. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, we'll see about that. Um, will be um, certainly in the top two records Ken ever made. And, and, and he absolutely loved it. And it's totally, utterly unique and different. It's like nothing he's ever done. Nothing. Right. So, and anyway. Really so, done so, in that year, we were also. I can't remember the month we were we were going to St. Petersburg to do a show. So for Ken, his nearest airport's Alicante. Right. So he had to fly Alicante, Moscow, Moscow, St. Petersburg. I just flew direct from London. Right. And so he got to the airport, business class line for Aeroflot, tap on the shoulder. Guy wants a photo. Um, actually, it was a guy in a wheelchair. And um, and Ken, which I saw firsthand all over the planet, never said no. So a camera was pointed at him, no words were exchanged, got on the plane, took off. A short time later, stewardess comes over to Ken because this chap's got on the plane because he was in the check-in line. He doesn't speak Spanish or, 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 or English. So he's using the stewardess to tell Ken, thank you very much for the photo. I'm a huge fan. And thank you very much. So Ken responds. And then during the chats with the stewardess, it turns out this chap also has a house about an hour and a half from where Ken lives, up the coast. And then, well, we returned home and a little while later, this chap, mate, Vladimir, makes contact with Ken um, and says, would you like to come to dinner and maybe bring a guitar and do some songs? Ken goes up whenever it was. And uh, at the end of that, uh, Vladimir says to him, look, you know, my hobby is poetry. It'd be great to have my hero. Could you put a bit of music or a couple of the poems? So originally, you know, Ken's polite, says, yeah, yeah, well, send me something, and leaves. Tells me this the following day, and he said, what do you think? And I said, well, look, we've already agreed we're not going to do anything January, February, or March 2020 because you've had two years really, really busy. You love to write, so once you've really recovered, because you've still got commitments for the rest of the 19, once you've recovered, then, you know, see how you feel, have a look at it, why not? And Ken always loved challenge and change. So literally, 
at the end of that year, and this, this is a remarkable fact, huh? um, we were doing a corporate show for Gazprom. Right. Huge, huge, yeah. The biggest company in Russia yeah. and I think the biggest energy company in the world, who we know very well, um, in St. Petersburg. So again, he's flying from Alicante, I'm flying from London. But it was a show to be performed on Boxing Day. So we both flew out on Christmas Eve, rehearsed with local musicians because we didn't have time for the band to get visas. But Ken and I carry year visas yeah. for Russia. And um, and I had our had our Christmas dinner in the hotel. And, and the reason I mentioned it, then we did the show and the following day, 28th flew home. That's the last time I got on an airplane since nine in a year, since 1970. Because last year I never got on a plane and nor did Ken. And um, anyway, so he told me about writing. So when he got back, um, he wrote a couple of things and sent me a couple of demos, just acoustic and on his phone. He said, what do you think? I said, well, this one, I really, I like the ideas of this. I said, you know, need to embellish it a bit more, but yeah. And he said, and the other one, I said, just needs more work, but the essence of it is cool. And he said, okay, okay. So then he worked on one of the songs and he sent me like a, then it, we got Tommy, who's got a studio and plays drums in Alicante. And he phoned me up, he said, I need, I need, yeah, I need, see you, I need voices on this. I need backing singers. Yeah. So I got Rosie up in Yorkshire, Belinda in Teddington, yeah. Ekaterina in Russia and Roberto in Italy. Got them all to record at home part, sent them files yeah. and film on the phone so we could use it in a video. And then we did a mix and sent it to Vladimir and he absolutely freaked out. And then it's, oh, we got to do an album. But of course, at this time, the, the world had been subjected to the virus. So predominantly the whole album is, was done, you know, remotely. Uh, a couple of times, Tom did go over when there was a break of the of the lockdown. Ken would go over to Tommy's studio, uh, really more than anything to listen to a mix or maybe put a vocal down. Uh, otherwise, it was all done remotely. Um, Vladimir had stayed in Spain. I mean, literally right up until um, late October last year before Ken passed. Um, and um, and it, it just grew and grew. And I mean, and Vladimir was just beside himself. And he said, Ken, he said, you know, I, I, we should do video. And uh, so we had the phone of the song called Stand. And so we put that together. He said, no, you should do a video for every song. He said, nobody does that. He said, well, I'll give you some money. We do every song. So we've done one for every song, you know, very low budget, but we've done one for every song. Then there's later this year, if it comes Very low to budget. It. I mean, the, the total for all nine songs, I think was only 30 grand. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, people, you remember that the heydays, they'd spend that for a nanosecond in one okay. song. Play that on, on hair and makeup. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but, um, but yeah, and you know, and some of the films are really good. Yeah. You know, and that, but, but they are in his era films. Okay. Um, and um, there, we will eventually um, put out a book of the poem in Russian, the translate, the original translation. Then it will have, which we've already got, which he did before he passed handwritten notes of Ken's about how he's adapted or changed lyrics and so on, and how it all came together with 
illustrations from a Russian artist of each song. Um, Lesia. Lesia. And, and I think what the uh, the other thing as well is, um, which your 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 viewers um, may know or may may not know, but it's public knowledge because it was in his book that was published early this millennium. But um, at the end of heat and after heat, you know, Canada had a major cocaine problem. It's public knowledge. And part of him getting clean was he became a born again Christian. And um, Ken was very private with his faith, but I had great faith. You know, he still swore like a trooper, smoked and drank, um, and didn't go to church, but his faith was very important to him. And Vladimir was in a wheelchair that I mentioned earlier because he almost died at 28 years old. Um, major spinal injuries that are still treated to this day. Um, and he's a Christian. So you've got the fan relationship, knowing the artist and all the music. You've got the, the joy of their faith, which when you get a chance, if the record label asked me to write something uh, on, on the sleeve, and I write um, about their relationship, their friendship, and their faith was unyielding. And it was because they both have strong faith. So there are so many areas of fate that brought, uh, brought this together. Uh, and for the observer, I've been probably none more expressive indirectly than the song on the album called Suddenly, where the lyric actually, if you like, now Kenner's passed, actually could have been written about his passing. Um, and um, yeah, Vladimir's uh, an extraordinary chap and Ken was an extraordinary chap. So bringing those two oddballs together and, you know, it's I mean, Vladimir Emelin, his name is if Vladimir you know. Emelin. And yeah. I mean, and but he just like Ken, he was uh, he, Vladimir is prolific. I mean, 160 different poems he's written, oh. and I, I yeah. absolutely incredible. And um, but the interesting thing, as, as you highlighted, is that it's in Russian. It gets translated to English and, and then Ken works on it. You get all the little notes and things like that. And what's lovely about the booklet, you don't discard all of that. You show the process. So you show yes. the original Russian, you show the yes. translation, you show yes. Ken's notes on it. And yes. fans and other people see that whole process and the interesting journey that people go on. Indeed, indeed. I mean, the other thing that brought them together as well is sadly, I mean, how I'm going to go about this, I have no idea. I'll discuss it with Monica, Ken's wife, eventually, and when I can spend real time down there. But Ken's been writing poetry since, I mean, Ken's got over a thousand poems. Right. And only in the last year and a half did we start to talk about how does he um, start choosing an amount that I could talk to some book publishers I know about him doing a book of poetry. So that was another element of him and Vladimir. You know, so, um, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it's interesting because obviously with, well, let's be candid, whilst you might find my career interesting, if Ken was alive to promote this record, the media would be talking to Ken, yeah. not to me. Um, and I find that uh, um, that's kind of, um, um, it wouldn't be as, as open um, when you're talking directly to an artist because they'll, they'll be kind of blinkered to a point. Um, and, and uh, you know, I think that, uh, I mean, 
Another thing uh, that we did on October the 9th last year was um, we hired a little hall nearest to where Ken lives, nearest village or little town. Um, and we had all the musicians on the record. So we had the strings, the band, blah, 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 and Ken. And Vladimir was there and his people and a couple of local people and did a concert and filmed the whole thing. So we have that as well. But that, you know, there's a lot of work to edit, make sure everything's tidy in that, which eventually will will have a life. And, and, and it is incredible because he Ken died on November the 4th last mm -hmm. year. He was only 75, as you say. So the concert was just a matter of weeks before days, actually. Yes. A whole month. Um, yeah. and, and quite extraordinary. How was he at, at that concert? How was he? Um, well, he, I, for me, I mean, he was getting tired. Uh, he was so busy, you know, last year getting this record. You know, he, we, he had to do a lot of media for the Heat Box set, um, and which obviously was done on the phone or, or by, by Zooms. Um, but he, yeah, he was, he was getting very zoomed. Absolutely, yeah. he, he was uh, he was get, getting tired uh, and kind of excited and also nervous as he was, regardless of how many gazillion shows he'd done. You know, most artists do suffer some kind of nerves, um, and um, yeah, but um, you know, he wasn't. Ha he phoned me. Because I couldn't go because of, you know, we couldn't fly. That was the hardest thing for me all last year. I mean, normally I go down for a week at least for his birthday in August. Right. I have a great time because the weather's great. Yes. And um, so, yeah, I couldn't go and um, couldn't even go for his cremation, right. nor could his family. And, and why? Uh, I mean, and, and he, you know, in the chronology, right. um, Literally, uh, he'd started to work on ideas for the book after the film. And then on the 3rd of November, um, Monica called me from the car and said she was taking him to hospital. And he had a running a bit of a temperature and a bit of shortness of breath. So, of course, you automatically think, ah, oh, COVID. Get to the hospital. And um, within an hour and a half, two hours, they COVID test negative. Under Spanish regulation, you had to remain in hospital. If you were tested in hospital, you have to remain for 48 hours. So it was a Tuesday. And by lunchtime, his temperature was back to normal. Breathing was fine. Um, and so Monica said she was going to go home and get his laptop and a couple of things for overnight. I spoke to him about 6.30 because we literally spoke once or twice every day of the week, Monday to Saturday, and never Sundays. Um, and, and nothing to do with religion either. Um, and um, so I spoke to him about 6.30 on the phone for about half an hour, a um, few work things. And then he just, he was saying how bored he was lying in hospital, although he had his laptop with him and he was looking forward to going home on Thursday. And then the following day, I mean, Monica called me very early in the morning, um, very emotional, um, saying the hospital run, his health was deteriorating. By the time she got there running all kinds of tests, they couldn't let her in the room. Uh, then at different times they did. She kept, you know, calling me. And then about 7.15, she called and said, he's gone into a coma. And five minutes later, she rang and said he's passed. And, and it turned out to be septic shock. And, you know, he hadn't had a fall, he hadn't cut himself. So... 
that under their law um, in COVID, if you die in hospital, you have to be cremated in 24 hours. So how the septic shot, how the infection got there, we'll never know. Yeah. So, uh, so his two remaining brothers and sister here couldn't go. I couldn't go. Um, his, you know, dear friends in Europe couldn't go. And, um, and Monica will come over eventually um, with some of the ashes to, to go here where he wanted them to be in some few there. But um, it was totally out of the blue. I mean, there was no hint, sign, <coughs> just uh, life. <coughs> Excuse me. And, and it was a, a, a very, it was a changed life, wasn't it? When, when he moved, he, he went over to North America in 1980. And then, as you say, the, the, he, it, it's well documented about his, his struggle with drugs and, and, and other issues. He was a sort of changed man when he met Monica and then moved over to Alicante or near Alicante. Mm -hmm. Um, but still incredibly creative in all that time. And he had, what, 13 studio albums, one live recording. He had a, three solo albums, apart from, uh, uh, obviously, his fantastic time with Uriah Heep and his great legacy of work. Uh, he was with Blackfoot, wasn't he? He did a couple of albums there, um, as well as, as other things. Uh, and and what, what people forget, and a lot of people won't know this, which is why it's so important to put it into context, is mm -hmm. he was probably, for a lot of people, an unsung hero. As you say, we would be unraveling his story now if the circumstances had been a, a few things, and what a story that would have been. Yes, indeed. I mean, you know, he played a huge role in the media. Um, there were four bands that kind of came out of Britain and the media said took rock to the world. They were nicknamed the Quartet. And that was Purple, Zeppelin, Uriah Heep and Black Sabbath. You know, Heep were the first, I believe the first uh, Western band to play in Russia. Um, you know, I mean, they, um, early, early 70s played the Budokan in Japan. Um, and, uh, Got their name from Charles Dickens in 1970. Yes, indeed. Well, 1969, the Christmas time. It was yes. over everywhere because of Charles Dickens' yeah. the anniversary yeah. of his death. And they changed the name, absolutely. Yeah. And a good and name. name. For the first album as a, as a result, wasn't it? Sort of uh, very heavy, very humble. Yes. Straight from, straight from what the, the phrase he would have used. Absolutely. 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 But they, I think for the connoisseurs, I mean, the classic heat lineup from the old band, yeah, was from it coincided with the songs he was writing, but also Lee Kerslake joining, yeah. and that was from Demons and Wizards, yeah, and and it was you know David Byron, Gary Thane, Lee, Mick Box, and 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 Ken, and of course you know I mean when Ken left, um, and of course David sadly. You know, they fired because he was become an alcoholic, which sadly killed him not long later. Gary, sadly, was a heroin addict, died from that. Trevor Boulder came into the band. Brilliant, brilliant Trevor Boulder, who sadly died a few years ago now. Um, and, you know, Bernie Shaw has been the singer in the band since, I don't know, early 80s. Phil Lanzan on keyboards. Um, I knew them before they did. I knew them in the 70s. They were in a band that was signed to RCA. Oh, <laughs> right. and, I, and I set up a reunion concert for the current heap, Ken and Lee, right. in Moscow in 2015. And the first time I saw Bernie and Phil was when I took them all, all 17 of people, roadies, everything, apart from Ken who lived in Spain, into the Russian consulate to get their visa, their, their fingerprints done. Right. <laughs> and uh, as you say earlier, 
very small degree of separation in our business. And that's that's why it's so important because it, I mean, you're right. He, they they were every really sort of every review you ever hear about them, they always say they were so underestimated yeah. uh, uh, as a band. I, I think really really tricky on that on that sort of basis. But such a talent and on stage. The charisma and, and great frontman, fantastic. The songwriting and so on and so forth. A mixed bag of albums, though some would say. Some some didn't get. No, the yeah, but very much so because you know um, it's like there's already a couple of reviews of this album where you know the reviewers are saying, "Oh, well, it's not what you'd expect." Okay, from Ken Hensley because they they want the old stuff. Right. Okay, but you wouldn't say that to David Bowie or Peter Gabriel, would you? Yeah, no, absolutely. So that's that's a media thing, and well, I can. I would know, say I would I say can, I, I, I can get I, it. I would, I would expect it from Ken because he's always changing. If you exactly. look at the body of work, exactly, it goes from every possible length. Yeah, right? yeah. I mean, expect the unexpected. From I'm, I'm gonna maybe have to end in a minute, but no problem. Well, I'll tell you we, what. Let's, we, let's we, we are just. Yeah. Just finish it um, with BMG at the end of this month. Yeah, it'll be 50 years since Lady in Black was released as a single. Yeah, so they 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 literally editing the final chapter of an animated lyric video, right? Which will be just digital and predominantly for the fans at the end of March and. And that was 50 years ago. And that lyric, it, it's a great lyric. And it's such a popular song to this day. It's had over 80 different covers. The last one I knew of, or remember, was about two and a half years ago, was Richie Blackmore covered it. Yeah. You know? Absolutely. But, well, finally, um, finally then, and then we'll, we'll let you go, because we spent hours talking. We will spend more time on uh, things, but it's a brilliant, brilliant album. I would recommend to everybody. Fantastic. First time ever getting nine videos done for every single track. Do yes. check those out. And we will dig out that final concert as well, because that sounds deserves the oxygen of publicity. Finally, though, how do you think such an incredible career, such a varied career, the highs and the lows, how do you think Ken Hensley himself would like to be remembered? As a songwriter, simple. As a songwriter, as a you know, as a decent man, huge animal lover, which I haven't gone on to. But Monica and Ken, when I first went there, they rescue animals. So when I first went there, there were fourteen dogs, about thirteen cats, chickens wandering around, sheep, goats, and they live about six hundred meters from the nearest B road. Second day I was there sitting on the terrace, having a, a glass of wine. There's a police car coming down on. What have you been up to? And he said, oh, it's probably an animal. Sure enough, animal. And uh, then I think two years later, another police car, a kitten, like six weeks old, that had been blinded on purpose, tortured, and thrown in a dumpster. So Ken and Monica, up the vets, 500 euros. They know the vet very well. Vet says best to remove the blinded eye. It will make the good eye stronger. So that cat had stripes, so they named it Tigressa, which is now a full, full grown cat. No joke, six weeks later, Another police car, another kitten, blinded in the eye. Took the vet, same thing, took the eye out. That cat, Simba, now big cat. Uh, they're incredible. Uh, they're absolutely amazing. And he'd love also to be remembered for that, I think. That's fun. But song, songwriter 
absolutely first first and foremost and and uh, totally um that wonderful body of work uh steve it's been an absolute delight we spent many hours together i'm sure we can spend many many more uh, telling many more tales uh but for now thank you very much in particular for remembering ken hensley uh, the album is out today uh the 5th of uh march i would urge everyone to go and get a copy um steve weltman thank you very much for joining me thank you andrew it's been a pleasure take care bye 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 so um, do go and get my book of answers out today, the 5th of March, Ken Hensley, a fantastic body of work. And uh, this will surprise a few people, nine tracks, nine videos to go with each of those tracks with the words by Vladimir Emelin, uh, who is a prolific poetry writer uh, in and of his own self. Uh, thanks very much again to my guest, Steve Weltman, a fascinating career in the music industry, many lessons to learn. We will get him back and listen to some more of those fantastic tales. Um, but for me, thank you very much for joining me. If you have any comments on the show, you can write to me at guests at octopustv.com. That's guests at octopustv.com. You can follow me at Andrew Eborn at Octopus TV. And don't forget to subscribe to Octopus TV on all of the usual channels. Uh, but for me, for now, thanks for joining me. I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.